This is part eight of the Craftsman 150 drill press rebuild series. If you haven't seen part seven, click the link at the top of the screen. In this video, we're going to be messing with the motor. Hello everyone, I'm Jeff and welcome to my shop. We got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. If you recall, when I purchased this motor, it was not running. I got it, uh, I bought it off of eBay and uh, received it, plugged it in, and it did not run. So there's a couple of things that could be, and some of them are easy and some of them are hard. I removed the bottom plate, and the first shocking thing that I see here is a round capacitor. And that's because these motors typically have the sardine can capacitor, not a round capacitor. So that's kind of weird in itself. But uh, assuming that the capacitor is good, we know that the power cord is definitely bad. It's frayed in several areas. There's exposed wiring. So I'm hoping that it's just the power cord or the switch that's on the power cord that needs to be replaced. So what I'm doing here is cutting the two wires that go to the power cord and I'm marking them so that I know what they go to when I go to rebuild the motor. And if the capacitor is good, then we're probably going to have to build a spacer plate for it. Because they don't make the sardine can capacitors anymore. So uh, now I'm just cutting off the power cord so that I can pull it back through. And that's what's left of it. Pretty bad shape. This motor was built in 1944, so <laughs> it's pretty old, but that's why we use these motors because they, they were built to last back then. So now I'm stripping the two wires and then I'm going to uh, crimp on terminals so that they are connected to the power cord itself. I could have just used some wire nuts since this is a temporary connection, but yeah, we always need practice at messing with the electrical stuff. Closing back up the bottom. And then there's no switch in this circuit now, so I'll use the switch on the plug strip to power on and power off the motor. And Presto, motor runs. So we're going to let it run for a few seconds here. Make sure it's not smoking. And then I'm going to listen to see if I can hear the click of the centrifugal switch disengaging. And I heard it, so we are good to go. All right, so now that we know the motor is working, and we're going to go ahead and remove the two pulleys that are on it right now. Now, neither one of these pulleys are going to be used for the drill press rebuild, but uh, I'm not going to just throw them away. So I want to take care to not damage them as best as possible. There was a shim on this end that shimmed it. And the set screws are flat tip set screws, which should also be an indicator of just how old this is. This other pulley, the uh, four stage pulley, is pretty rusted onto the shaft. So I'm squirting some PB blaster in there. And then we're gonna use the pulley puller and a eight millimeter socket, I think, to uh, get it off of there. I 
So this is the earliest version of this motor that I've actually uh, put my hands on. The, the 1156962 one is the motor that I really like. And it's the one that's on my personal drill press. And this is an earlier version of that motor. So I'm removing the four machine screws that hold on the felt retainer. And one of the cool things about these motors were that uh, the end of the bearing that's facing up or out of the motor is open. There's no seal on it. So you could grease these bearings or service them without having to opening up the motor. So that is the bearing felt. And that next part is an end cap. And that is a spring washer. And there you can see the bearing exposed. There's also a thin paper gasket that's on there. Usually those things are really trashed by the time you get to them, but that one was actually in pretty decent shape. So back in the day when these were made, they used a lot of paper and cardboard for insulation Um, on the electrical components, uh, the insulator that goes between the sardine can and this cover that I'm removing right now is typically cardboard. And even that capacitor you see there has a cardboard sleeve over it. So now I'm removing the terminals and letting the power cord fall away. And I'm not disassembling this in any kind of order, so you know, sorry about that. So I'm removing the through bolt and the nuts that are on each end of it. Later models would get acorn nuts that go on there, but these are just your standard nut. And they were pretty rusted, so no big deal. So there's four through bolts and each one of them has two nuts on it. And that's what holds the motor together. But we're going to go ahead and look at the other side and remove this felt retainer. It's got four screws that hold it in place. I dropped a screw, there we go. And you'll notice that the terminal cover there is missing. So we're gonna have to fabricate that. And I'm removing the screw that would hold that cover on. So I'm gonna grab some tracing paper and I'm gonna just rough out where the terminal cover would be and mark it for the screw holes. And then I'm going to transfer that over to a piece of cardboard. And I'm fighting with the fan that's blowing cold air on me because I'm in Georgia and it's 100 degrees outside, which means it's probably about 80 degrees in my shop.
Good old trauma shears. They cut through damn near anything. So we've got our cardboard cover. And this is just a template. We'll transfer this over to a piece of plate steel and fabricate a replacement. And just trimming it up a little. Making sure it's going to have a nice fit. Follows the outside curve. So we're good to go. We're just going to set that aside for now. And we're back to disassembling this thing. So we are removing the felt retainer. You'll notice that I've got two plastic bins there on the table. Everything that goes in the one that I'm putting that in is going to get put in the simple green and in the uh, de-rusting citric acid. But this felt seal, for example, will not go in there. It's going to go in the other plastic bin. And that's all the stuff that does not get submerged. So this is the end cap. And I'm checking here to see, because like I said, those paper gaskets get really messed up and they're hard to distinguish when everything's so dirty. Sometimes they stick to that piece there. But nope, no paper gasket on this end. So we'll have to make one of those as well. So we're back to removing these through bolts. And this is the third one. This is the fourth one. So here we are back on the bottom side of the motor and I'm marking the two wires that go to the capacitor and then I'm going to remove them from the capacitor. So they're soldered onto this capacitor. So I'm heating up my soldering iron. And I'm going to use a quick clamp to add some weight to that capacitor so that it's pulling it down while I lift up on the wire while I'm removing the solder. And there's the capacitor. And I'm just cleaning out the holes that those wires will get re-soldered into when we reassemble this. So there are two bolts that hold the base on the motor. They're just bolted directly to the stator, which is the big center section of a motor. And this is how we're going to ground the motor when we install the new power cord too. We're going to run a ground directly to one of those bolts. Because the old wiring was just two wire, no ground, which is typical of the time. And there's your base. And so the stator band is made out of steel and it's just bent over 
And here I'm just using a pair of needle nose pliers to unbend it, and that's what separates it. So this one's pretty rusted, as is the identification plate as well. So now I'm using a uh, brass rod and my brass tip hammer to knock loose the end bell that has the terminal on it. Now I'm being kind of careful because we're not going to remove this end completely. The centrifugal switch that uh, disengages the start cycle of the motor is on the armature or the shaft, the thing that runs all the way through the motor, which is called an armature. And the bearing for this end is sitting above that switch. So if I were to just lift the bell off of there without pulling the armature out with me, it would rip that switch apart. So I just want to get an idea of what we're dealing with here. And now I'm going to start undoing the two bolts that are, or the two nuts that are on the terminal itself. And removing these wires that are connected to the terminal. And in the process of doing this, I totally screwed up that terminal. So the terminal is made out of a phonoletic kind of a fiberglass material. It's actually like a bunch of cardboard that was heat pressed with some kind of resin that's uh, insulating and heat resistant. But it's really brittle and it comes apart real easily. Most of the components for the switch are made out of the same material, so you got to be kind of careful with it. So that's the first wire, and I'm just marking it on what it goes to. Now I'm on the other end of the motor, and I'm using the brass rod to release that end bell. And the only thing that's holding this end bell on now is the bearing that's on the armature. So if I start pushing the bearing through it, that end bell will come off. There's no electronics or anything like that on this end. So the only thing that is on this end is a cover that's in there. And you've got two screws that hold it in place. So I'm removing those screws. So that cover is called an air cone. But it's designed to just keep debris from falling down inside the motor. So now we can see the, this end of the armature and the single bearing that's sitting on it. And we can just push all that straight through the motor if we wanted to towards the other end. But there are wires that run from the coils you see to the centrifugal switch, which is screwed into the end bell that we're looking at now. So I'm just removing those screws. There's two of them. And then that centrifugal switch should completely stay with the stator. And that's the switch shield. Now to get the switch 
off of the armature, I have to remove this bearing. So I'm using a bearing puller and a socket to get that bearing off of there. And there you go. And then under that bearing, there's usually a couple of spacers or shims. And this one had a paper shim and a metal shim. But I couldn't tell that the paper one was paper, so it ended up going in the simple green. No big deal. And that was the switch insulation. And that is the switch itself. And so I'm undoing the wires that are still connected to that piece of terminal board that's broken. And you'll see the terminal board just comes apart in my hands here. There you go. But once we got all that done, we removed the switch, marked the ends of those cables. And then there's your armature. And we're just taking a look at the windings that are on the stator, setting it aside. So now we're pulling the bearing on the other end of the armature. Yes, there's an easier way to do this, but... I just went ahead and did it this way. And it also had some shims on this end. I think there was three of them. Yeah. So next we've got the centrifugal switch that's on the armature and it has two springs that allow it to function and it has arms I guess is the easiest way to explain them that are on each end and the springs retract those arms when it's not spinning or when it slows down to a certain speed so when it spins up to a certain speed those arms flip out, which disengages the start sequence of the motor or the start phase. I'm just making sure those springs are in good condition. And most people don't disassemble this whole piece here, but I do. So you can bend these aluminum brackets that hold those arms or fingers, if you will in place with a pair of needle nose just enough to get those pieces out. And there you go. And then you have this center sliding part that's plastic with a spring on it. And that's actually called the governor assembly. And there's no wrong way. Well, you can't put it back to on there the wrong way and have it go back together the way it's supposed to. And there was a couple of spacers under there. And there's a paper uh, insulator at the very bottom that I'm getting off of there now. making sure it's paper. Yep, it goes inside the bin. So there's actually a screw on one of the wings here or one of the blades and it's actually a rotor balancing rivet is what they refer to it, it and it's done at the factory to balance the spinning of the rotor or armature. So now I'm removing the screw and the remnants of the terminal that busted all the pieces. 
And that's pretty much the disassembly of the motor. So now we're going to put all these parts in simple green and let them sit for 24 hours. Even the armature. And yes, I'm putting the pulleys in here because I'm not going to be polishing them because we're not using them on this drill press. So just going to clean them up. So the last thing we have is the stator band and removal of the tag, the data plate. So I'm just using a drill bit to remove the outer edge of the rivet and then sand it down flush with a Dremel and then punch the rivets out. And I may have gone a little too hard on that one, but they'll come out and you can see some blue on that stator band. I believe that is the original color of this stator band. I don't know if the whole motor was painted that blue, but I know the stator band was. So if you're going to preserve the stator band, then you're going to want to remove that tag so that you can clean it up. I'm going to be fabricating a completely different stator band for this motor. And I'm going to be replacing that data plate as well, but we'll hang on to it. Anyways, that's where we are. I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please like and subscribe. And I've got more videos coming soon. So thanks and I'll see you next time.